On the 20th of January 1879, the British General Lord Chelmsford, who was tasked with invading the independent kingdom of Zululand, advanced his column to the foot of this hill behind me, Isandloana. Now he set up a camp which sprawled right across the foot of the mountain there on the open grassy slope beneath the rocky crags. From the moment that he arrived here, he expected to be attacked by the Zulu army. His intelligence department had brought him information that the Zulu king Trechwayo had sent his main army to confront this British force here at the Saint Loana. So once Chelmsford arrives, immediately he looks forward to see, well, where might this Zulu army be coming from? And he was very concerned about this range of hills uh, over here on my right. So on the 21st, he sent a large reconnaissance force out into these hills to scour through there to see if there was any signs of an approaching army. Late that evening, the commander of that reconnaissance, a Major Dartnell, ran into some Zulus forward from Isand Luana, about 12 miles off. Now, Dartnell sent the message back to Lord Chelmsford. He received it about 2 o'clock in the morning at his tent at the foot of Isand Luana there. And Chelmsford immediately thought, great, this fits in exactly with my concept of how this campaign is going. I've actually intercepted the Zulu army. They haven't reached me yet. It's the middle of the night. What I'm going to do is split my force in two. I'm going to take the most mobile element out from Isand Luana and I'm going to advance out to confront the Zulus. But I'm going to leave enough men behind to guard the camp. Now, of course, this was a decision which subsequently has earned Chelmsford a lot of criticism. But in many ways, there was a logic to it. He couldn't take his entire column with him and advance quickly now to confront the Zulus. If he'd sat around any longer, the Zulus would move somewhere else. He'd lose the advantage of that intelligence that he'd gained. So in some ways, it was uh, quite a, a rational decision to do that. And before dawn on the morning of the 22nd of January, uh, he moved half his force out down this open valley here, off into the hills in the distance to look for the main Zulu army. He left altogether about 1,700 men, British redcoats uh, and African auxiliaries fighting with them here at Isand Luana. He hadn't been gone terribly long when in fact Zulu, uh, a Zulu force appeared on the heights immediately to my left here, overlooking the camp. Now this really was a whole change in the strategic situation. It wasn't what Chelmsford had expected. He's marched off, he's out of the picture. The camp commander, Colonel Pullane, thought, well, don't really know what's going on here. Uh, and Pullane formed his men up in front of the tents. At about that time, a smaller detachment under a Colonel Durnford, mounted black troops fighting for the British, arrived at the Saint Luana, and Pullane and Durnford had a conference. Pullane says, well, sir, the general's marched out of it. He's off in these hills 12 miles away. We can hear some distant uh, gunshots from skirmishing that he's clearly engaged with some sort of Zulu force. But actually, there are some much closer on this side, uh, on the hills overlooking the camp. And Durnford decides, well, I've got a much more mobile force. I'm not bound by any orders to stay at the camp. I'm actually going to take then my own force out from Isand Luana and investigate these Zulu movements on the hills and find out what happens. And Durnford split his own men into two. Part of them advance across the plain and swing round the heights on this side. Part of them go up onto the hills on the other side, looking for the Zulus on the hills in the distance. The idea being, of course, to get them in some sort of pincer movement and to drive them away from the camp and also to drive them away from Lord Chelmsford. There was a very real feeling uh, that actually these movements might have been threatening Chelmsford rather than the camp at Saint Luana itself. Well, anyway, some of Durnford men, Durnford's men had gone about five miles from Saint Luana on the undulating heights uh, off in this direction when they saw some small Zulu parties retreating and they gave chase. And as they went over a hill, they looked down on the other side and what did they see? There were 25,000 men, the Zulu king's main army. And in fact, Lord Chelmsford's intelligence hadn't been so far out. The Zulus had come in this direction, but instead of moving off into these hills on my right here, they'd actually moved off to my left and were on the hills over here. Now, they weren't planning to attack on the 22nd of January. It was the night of the new moon. Uh, it was a time of ill omen to attack, uh, launch something like an attack. But in fact, as soon as they were discovered, of course, they realized there was no hope now of remaining undiscovered. Uh, and they rise up out of their valley and they advance in this direction towards the Saint Luana. Now, of course, 
Riders from Durnford's men went back to Colonel Poulain to inform him of this Zulu presence. But in fact, from his position down at the foot of the mountain, he really couldn't see the full extent of this developing Zulu attack. So what he did was to move out to a good position which commands the approaches of, from the camp. Uh, there's a line of wattle trees down there on the slope behind me uh, and Poulain pushed his infantry in a thin screen there so as to cover the approaches from uh, the heights in this direction. In the meantime Durnford has been driven back by the Zulus coming round on this side. His other detachments have also been forced off the hills so the British are then being driven back towards Isan Luana and this great Zulu attack rolls off the hills behind me. Now the Zulu is attacked in a three-pronged attack formation, Izimpondo Zankomo, uh, the horns of the charging bull. Uh, and the left horn sweeps around on this side, the chest came off the heights behind me here uh, and went across this ground where all the huts are today, facing Tulane's line on the open ground beyond. And the right horn was thrown out behind this Andluana, largely unspotted by the British Army, uh, on the other side there. Now, Colonel Durnford, as he retreated across the plain, reached a stream called the Unyogane, uh, and in that stream he dismounted his men and he made a stand. And that stand held up the Zulu left, swinging round against him uh, on that side. Uh, and the Zulu chest, indeed, also stalled in its attack against Poulain's infantry. There's a line of dongas where the huts are there, uh, and having got into those, they found it difficult to rise up and charge against the British on the higher ground above them. But in fact, although the British line seemed to be holding well, their position was fatally flawed. It was far too extended for the sort of attack that was now bearing down upon it. Large numbers of the Zulu Umbonambi regiment began to push through between Durnford's men uh, and Poulain's line further off in this direction. And Durnford himself, after he'd been engaged for a while, began to run out of ammunition. And he realized that he couldn't hold his position in the stream there uh, and he gave orders for his men to mount up and retire back towards the camp. Well that then now left the whole of Poulain's line outflanked uh, on their right with the Zulus beginning to sweep round on this side and Poulain gave the order for his men to fall back from their advanced position towards the tents. Uh, the Zulus say that they heard bugles sounding along the whole of the British line and the redcoats stopped firing and they rose up and they retired back towards the tents. But at that point, the Zulus, realizing the critical moment of the battle has arrived, rise up on their part and charge forward. And if Poulain's men were hoping to regroup somewhere near the camp at the foot of the mountain, they never had the chance. The Zulus rush in amongst them, they break up the British companies, uh, and they force them back, fighting hand to hand through the tents, and over there where you can see the spread of British graves, those whitewashed cairns on the green belt there, that marks where the British positions were driven back through the tents, trying to draw together, now under pressure from the whole Zulu army concentrating against them. And what do they find? Horror of horrors. As they get to that point below the mountain there, there is the right horn swung round on the other side, coming into the camp from the other side. Many of the British groups are brought to bay and killed there in the foot of the mountain. Others are forced down on the other side into the valley beyond. Uh, and the last stands of the 24th Regiment, those famous Victorian paintings of men standing heroically back to back, it was of course much more brutal and savage at the height of the battle than those paintings suggest, actually took place in the valleys behind De Saint Luana there. Colonel Durnford himself was killed, Colonel Poulain was also killed. Uh, of the 1,700 men who had been in the camp on the British side at the start of the battle, 1,300 were killed. Less than 100 white men actually got away. But it was a desperately costly battle for the Zulus as well. At least 1,000 of them were killed, and possibly as many as another 1,000 were mortally wounded, suffering dreadful rifle gunshot injuries uh, to be taken home by their comrades after the battle, only to die at some point either on the long journey home uh, or when they reached their families back in rural Zululand. Well, Lord Chelmsford, what happened to him? He'd spent the day out in the hills looking for that Zulu army that his reconnaissance had found the night before. Eventually, he begins to realize something horrible has happened here at Isant Luana, and he brings his troops back. He arrives late in the afternoon. By the time he gets there, the fighting is over, uh, and he reaches the foot of Isant Luana in the dark, 
and there are the bodies of his men lying strewn amongst the wrecked camp. I can't understand it, someone heard him say. I left a thousand men to guard the camp. Well, there was worse as far as he was concerned to come. As he stood on the neck below his Saint Luana there and looked back to Rourke's Drift, where he'd started his invasion less than a fortnight before, he saw the flames of the burning mission station, his base depot, on the Natal border in the distance, and he realised that that not only has the Zulu army overrun his camp here, it's got behind him into Natal, and it appears to be attacking the garrison that he left at Rourke's Drift.